everybody. We're going to read the next chapter in Touching Spirit Bear, chapter 10. Here we go. As Cole lay thinking about the sparrows, pain surged back and forth through his body. He felt himself slipping into darkness and blinked hard, doggedly clinging to life, willing himself to not let go. For hours, he kept blinking, but by dawn, staying conscious seemed less important. Now he hung on the edge of existence, detached from the real, real world, weightless and moved by the wind. Thoughts of the sparrows disappeared. As daylight seeped through thick curtains of haze, a new pain arrived and gradually worsened until it could not be ignored. Pressure had built in his lower gut. He needed desperately to go to the bathroom, but held back, grimacing. He had no way to squirm away from his own waist. Finally, the pain became so sharp, Cole let out a deep groan couldn't fight his own body any longer. Painful shame gripped Cole as, his, as waste slipped from his body, and a raw stench filled the air. He jerked his head and arm to drive away the mosquitoes swarming around him, but they returned instantly. Finally, he just gave up. An absolute and utter hopelessness overwhelmed him. He felt like a helpless baby, not able to roll away from his own filth. He wanted to hate somebody, to be angry, and to place blame on everything and everyone for this moment. But anger took energy, and Cole no longer had energy. As the sun climbed over the trees, black horseflies started attacking. Unable to drive them away, Cole felt the huge insects bite him. He gazed desperately away at the fallen tree beside him. A ten-foot trunk remained upright, its ragged tr top charred where lightning had struck. Whiffs of smoke still curled upward. Beside the trunk lay a, a tangle of broken timber. Cole watched the birds flitting among the downed branches, feeding on bugs and worms. For them, the storm was over and life continued. The falling of the tree was simply a natural reality, like the passing of another day. Cole eyed the birds as he struggled to concentrate. Something in those branches had been important. His gaze wandered to the ripped-up grass under the splintered branches and crushed boughs. What had been so important in the maze of destruction? He spotted a small, brown fist-sized clump of twigs, not ten, ten feet away. The nest. That was it. That was what he had been searching for. Something about that nest was important, but what? And then he found them. First one, then two, then a third, and a fourth. Four lifeless baby sparrows, scattered in the short grass where they had been thrown from their nest. Matted fuzz covered the twisted little bodies. Two had died with their big yellow beaks open as if searching for food. The other two lay facing the nest, their necks reaching out. Even in death, the sparrows had strained towards their nest. They had tried to make it back to the safety of their home. Cole envied the dead sparrows. He had never really known any home. It sure wasn't the big brick building that his parents landscaped and fixed up to impress the neighbors. Nor was it the empty space he returned to most days after school. Even before his parents' divorce, Cole had always wanted to run away from that place. As Cole stared at the tiny bodies, sadness flooded through him. The sparrows were so frail, helpless, and innocent. They hadn't deserved to die. Then again, what right did they have to live? This haunted Cole. Did the birds' insignificant little um, existences have any meaning at all? Or did his? He watched one solitary gray sparrow hopping among the broken branches near the nest. Was that the mother? Was she looking for her young? Cole licked his cracked and dried lips. At least the babies had a mother to search for them. Nobody, not even a scrawny gray bird, was looking for him. Cole's eyes grew moist. He couldn't stop thinking about the tiny birds strewn in the grass. Had they suffered before they died? Or did their fragile existence just suddenly stop? And what had happened to their energy and their hearts quick beating? It didn't seem quite right that now maggots would eat their bodies. Or maybe that they would just not or that they would just rot into the ground to help the grass grow. Maybe that was the circle Edwin had spoken of. You live, die, and rot. Then something else lives, dies, and rots. Cole understood the cycle. Beside him a tree had died. Already, ants and bugs crawled among the cracked bark and splintered wood. For them, life went on. In a few weeks they would make new homes from the wood. With time the tree would rot and become dirt. Then a new seed would fall and grow, and another tree would push upward. Years later, that tree would fall back down to earth and begin the cycle all over again. Yes, death was part of the living. 
Cole knew his own body would eventually die and decay and be reduced to dirt. That was okay. That was how the world worked. But how had the world benefited from his living? Was he no better than a tree or some weed? Was his life just fertilizer for the soil? Cole grunted angrily. He didn't want to die yet. Yes, someday that would be part of his circle. Someday he would lie in his own waste and be eaten by maggots, but not now. Suddenly, in that moment, Cole made a simple decision. He wanted to live. In death, there was no control, no anger, no one to blame, no choices, no nothing. To be alive was to have choice. The power to choose was real power, not the fake power of making others afraid. Cole knew that he had used that fake power many times. All of his life, he had squandered his choices, wallowing in revenge and self-pity, keeping himself down. Now, as he lay near death, those he had hated were safe and warm. Those he had blamed were still alive and well. He had hurt himself most. Life was empty and meaningless unless he found some meaning. Maybe it was a vision, or maybe just a thought, maybe a hallucination. A simple image entered Cole's mind, a tiny sparrow in a nest, helpless, neck straining upward, mouth gaping open. The sparrow Cole imagined was not angry. The young bird was helpless. It knew nothing of pride or control. It pleaded only for help, wanting nothing more than a worm brought by its mother. A worm was food. Food was energy, and energy was life. The baby begged simply for life. Mosquitoes and horseflies swarmed around Cole's face. He grunted and jerked his head. It didn't matter who was at fault for his dismal life. All that mattered was living. Cole wanted to live and once again make choices. But to live, he needed food, and soon. But how? Every ounce of food he had eaten earlier lay in vomited chunks beside his body. Cole fingered blades of grass under his left hand, then broke off a few and brought, brought them to his lips. His dry, swollen tongue felt stuffed into his mouth. Deliberately, he opened his crusted lips and poked the grass inside. As he worked his jaws to chew, he reached for more grass. Gradually, the stringy green blades formed a wad in his mouth, and he swallowed. Without water, the clump caught in his throat. Again, he tried to swallow, but he gagged. The clump was stuck and refused to go down or come back up. Panicking, Cole stifled a cough. He didn't dare cough. Frantically, he gagged harder, twisting his head, straining until he felt blood vessels bulge on his face. He couldn't breathe. The clump was suffocating him. Raising his head, mouth wide open, he convulsed, frantic and desperate to dislodge the grass. His body screamed for air. Then suddenly, explosively, he coughed, ejecting the wad of grass. Violent pain, like the claws of the spirit bear, ripped at his ribs. Cole gasped and clenched his teeth, hugging his side with his left arm while his head swam in the fog. A long, grueling minute passed before the pain eased and he dared allow a shallow breath to seep past his lips. Sweat beaded his forehead. When he opened his eyes again, he glanced around and found the stringy lump of grass on the ground beside his chest. He stared. What other choice did he have if he wanted to live? Reluctantly, he picked up the wad and returned it to his mouth. This time he chewed a very long time before swallowing. He exhaled with relief when the grass went down. As Cole reached for more grass, he spotted a worm near his hand and grabbed it instead. The long worm bunched up and squirmed to get free, so he brought it quickly to his mouth and poked it safely past his cracked lips. It coiled against his tongue as he bit it and started chewing. The worm was easier to chew than grass and went down with the first swallow. Cole searched for another. As he searched, the rain began again. He opened his mouth and let the drops tickle his tongue. Maybe the rain would bring out some more worms. The second and third worms Cole found were smaller, and he ate them quickly. His teeth crunched on dirt, and there wasn't much flavor, but he chewed as he watched another big worm creep slowly past his hand, just inches beyond his reach. Failing to find more worms, he turned his attention to bugs. The ground teemed with insects, and he began putting ants, beetles, spiders, and even a fuzzy caterpillar into his mouth. With each insect, he closed his eyes and imagined a baby sparrow reaching upward with an open beak. Finally, exhausted, Cole rested. Sometime later, the rain stopped and a warm sun brought back the thick clouds of mosquitoes and horseflies. They swarmed over Cole's body as if he were a dead carcass. He tried to shoo them away with an awkward swing of his hand, but they returned before his fingers touched the ground. Dozens blanketed his bloody, bloody face, neck, chest, and arms. The only place Cole felt no bites were on his broken right arm. He raised his head to look. His right arm was shaded 
back black with mosquitoes as thick as hair. Cole could only stare, and finally he closed his eyes. In, his, in the darkness, he still felt the sharp bites of the horseflies, and he felt the mosquitoes, dozens and dozens of tiny pins pricking him, sucking at him, leaving their itchy venom behind. If only he had the owl blanket for protection. He had no idea where the blanket was. How could he have ever tried to burn it? It would have protected him from the cold, the rain, the wind, and the insects. It might even have protected him from himself. Cole lost consciousness again. Hours later, drifting awake, Cole became aware of a, a tickling sensation on his left arm. He opened his eyes to find a small gray mouse perched on his elbow, working its way towards his wrist. It stopped every step to poke a whiskered nose about. Cole lay motionless as the skittish mouse ventured across his forearm and sniffed at his wrist, then inched onto his upturned palm. Cole held his breath. He would only have one chance. Catching this mouse would be better than a dozen worms or a hundred bugs. The mosquitoes had not slowed their feasting. Hundreds covered Cole's exposed skin, their tiny torsos swollen with blood. Several landed on his eyelids, and Cole blinked to drive them away. He dared not move his hand to swat at them. Focusing his gaze on the mouse, he waited for it to take one more step. It moved its whiskered head back and forth with jerky caution, then stepped forward. Cole clamped his hand closed.